Old Testament, if you're new to the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and then Judges. So you can turn there in your Bible. A tradition or a history or an intention we've started in our church is to seize a, a few weeks out of the year, sometimes more, sometimes less, to do what you might call survey messages, survey series. I explained this last week, and if you're, if you're new this week, just to explain why we do this, we, we look at a large section of Scripture, maybe a, a number of chapters, or even, as in this morning, a whole book of the Bible, uh, obviously, knowing we can't get into every detail of it, that's not the goal. It's impossible anyway to do that on a single morning. Uh, but so that we see some of the overarching themes of sections of Scripture, and also to motivate us to read and understand parts of the Bible that maybe we don't read as often or dive into as much, or maybe we know the details, but we don't see how they connect to the big picture. That's why we do this. We, we want to love all of the Bible and of course, uh, just because of the length of the Bible, if we only studied one verse or one chapter at a time uh, in my lifetime, we would, we would never get to parts of the Bible. So the goal is to at least provide something of a taste of certain sections of Scripture, even if we can't get into every detail of it. So this morning, we're looking at the book of Judges, the book of Judges. At the same time, it contains some of the most well-known stories of the Bible, and yet also, it is very unknown as a book. Uh, there are certain parts of it that are well known, like the stories of Samson and the stories of Gideon and other parts that nobody's ever heard of. And frankly, when they read, uh, it's frightening and revolting and they move on. So this is a, a, a little bit of a conflicted history on the reading of this book, I think, in Christian churches. Um, but it, if it's understood the way I think it's intending to be understood, it has a profound message for us. Profound and relevant message for us. Reading this, or preparing for this message, I was reminded of interviews that a reporter, a, a journalist named David Frost, uh, for some of you, that name is familiar. There's going to be an age gap <laughs> in the familiarity of that name. David Frost was a, a journalist and in the 1970s, he interviewed former President Nixon. Uh, Nixon had resigned following uh, allegations and indictments of a cover-up and obstruction of justice, as those old enough to remember would be able to tell you. Other than that, look up Wikipedia and you can find it. Um, and Frost wanted to interview him and, and basically get his side of the story, hear his, his take. Uh, unfortunately for Nixon, his take uh, only further convinced people uh, that he was guilty. He came away from those interviews uh, with nobody convinced of any innocence, quite the contrary. And part of that may have been because of a single sentence uh, in the interviews when the president said, former president, said this, when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. When the president does it, that means it's not illegal. Now, probably uh, Nixon did not mean that in its most terrible definition. Uh, however, in the context of a resignation based on the accusation of a cover-up, uh, that sentence undoubtedly had an incredibly negative effect on his reputation. It indicated what most likely many people believed that this was his perspective, that due to his office, due to his position, that his perspective about right gave him the right to do whatever he wanted. That is precisely the situation found in the Judges. The book of Judges ends with a phrase that is very much like but Nixon says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's the culture of judges. And actually, that's why I think judges is incredibly relevant for us today. Because uh, that could be called the motto, the theme of our times. So I'm postmodern times. Couldn't it be? Uh, 
everyone should be able to do what is right in their own eyes. If it's true for you, it's true. There is no objective truth. If it feels good, do it. Or the Disney version, follow your heart. That's the modern belief system, isn't it? Well, it's right here in the book of Judges. That's why I, I don't want us to skip over as Christians or as a church this book, because it actually speaks right to us. Almost, almost profoundly, almost eerily, you read Judges and you can hear echoes of modern thinking. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes. People making up their own versions of religion. People referencing God, but also following idols. People deciding what's right and wrong. People doing terrible things, but then absolutely outraged when they see other people doing terrible things. And the incredible hypocrisy is there throughout the book. This is the culture of judges. It reveals the depth that sin can take people to. That's what judges does. It reveals the depth that can take people to. And in that sense, it can be a discouraging book. Except that it also reveals the solution to that problem. It reveals the culture, and in that revelation, it paints a picture of a need. A need that can only be filled one place. By God providing deliverance. The book of Judges reveals the depth of sinfulness and the desperate need for a perfect savior king. I would write that sentence down because if you ever read the book of Judges, I think that'll help you understand one story after another. Throughout the book, that's really the truth that God is pushing forward. It reveals the depth of sinfulness, everyone doing what's right in their own eyes, and the need for a perfect savior king. And in doing that, it motivates us to trust ourselves to the Savior King that God provides. That's what it does. That's the book of Judges. Uh, there's basically three distinguishable sections in Judges. Let me, let me give you those sections. S chapters 1 and 2, chapters 1 and 2, uh, are basically describe the spiritual condition in Israel, and I'm going to call that point two ways to live. Okay, that's chapters one and two, roughly. Two ways to live. It, it describes Israel uh, with two different uh, ways, choices laying before them. Then chapter about three to about 16 covers uh, this history of judges, these deliverers that God raises up. Those are all the stories that everybody knows. Samson and, and Gideon and so forth. Deborah, you know. These are the stories that you tell in Bible class um, when you're a kid, if you go to church. So I'm going to call that, that section the source of salvation. So two ways to live, chapters 1 and 2. Then chapters 3 through about 16, the source of salvation. We'll see a repeating cycle. And then the final chapters of the book, I'm going to call the disgusting chaos of sin. The disgusting chaos of sin. Because that's what's happened. There's basically two stories at the end. They're not about judges. They're just kind of zooming in. It's like the, the camera zooms in to these two kind of like illustrations. Here's what's going on in Israel. When it says that they're doing what's right in their own eyes, let me give you a couple of examples. And the, the, the writer ends the book with these two incredibly horrendous stories about the chaos that's present among God's people. That, that's the outline. So if you're going to read Judges... That's to give you a framework. Two ways to live. Then this cyclical history of, of the source of salvation, the judge's history. And then the final chapters when it describes the chaos that the nation has descended into. That's, that's the, the structure of the book. All of it pushing towards a clear picture of the depth of human sinfulness and the need for a perfect savior king. That's judges. There it is. There you have it. Let, let's, let's dive into each section and see if we can pull out some of the truths that are present here. First of all, two ways to live. Let's look at this first two chapters just in an overview section. Let me read uh, just sections out of these two chapters. Chapter 1, verse 1 of Judges. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, 
Come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. You want to notice the people of God at this point are working together. There is a unity. They're fighting together as God called them to do against the evil inhabitants of the land, a calling God had given them, unique calling God had given him in this time in history. So Simeon went with him. Then Judah, these are tribes, not just the two brothers. These are, these are tribes, Judah and Simeon. And the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. Now jump down to verse 8. The men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. If you want to hear more about uh, God's determination to punish the evil inhabitants of the land by means of Israel, I'll refer you back to the message last week in Joshua. But they defeat this city of Judah. Then go down to verse 11. From there they went against the inhabitants of Deborah. The name of Deborah was formerly Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, He who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, for a wife. Uh, I hope Aksa was okay with that. I don't know. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, for a wife. So there's this, there's this victory. There's also a geographical thing going on here. You might call this victory in the south. Simeon and Judah are fighting together. They're obeying God. They're trusting God. They're going against the inhabitants of the land. God's purposes to punish the evil inhabitants of Canaan are being fulfilled. There's this sense of the onward march of God's people accomplishing what he called them to do and bringing about his purpose. But then something negative begins to happen in verse 21. But the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Then jump down to verse 27. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Bethsheen and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Verse 29, Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron. 31, Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Echo. Verse 33, the Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. Verse 34, the Amorites pressed the people of Dan, that's the bad guys pressing the good guys, back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. The Amorites persisted in dwelling in Mount Heres, in Ahalon. Practically, there is an initial victory followed by an incredible amount of laxity and failure to do what God had called them to do. And God had warned them, if you allow this people to remain in the land, you will eventually follow their gods. This will lead to spiritual apostasy and my judgment will come upon you. That's what's going to happen. So the, the, the book starts with this major key and then it quickly goes to a minor key. Two ways to live. Now, practically, that's chapter one. Chapter two describes the same situation except with a spiritual filter. Chapter two, verse one. Now, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt. I brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But... You have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. The people, it says in verse 4, lifted up their voices and wept, and they called that place the place of Bochim. Significantly, though, they do not put away the false gods that are among them. You'll notice in the book of Judges at times a certain kind of weeping that does not lead to permanent repentance. Go down to verse 11. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. 
Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them, yet they did not listen to their judges. For they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, for they obeyed the commandments of the Lord. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and pressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods and serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of of the Lord as their fathers did or not. Do you see that truth coming out of those first two chapters? Two ways to live. Isn't that what's there? As you read it, if you're, if you're an Israelite child reading this centuries later, maybe, and, and trying to perceive the intention of the writer of this book, what's the intention of those first two chapters? Look, there's, there's two ways to live. You can trust God and obey him. It'll take risk. It'll take faith. It'll take sacrifice. It'll take battling the enemies that God has pointed out to you. Or there's the way of, of spiritual laziness, which eventually leads to compromise, which eventually leads to abandoning the Lord, which leads to God's discipline. And even in that moment, God will provide salvation that is merciful and gracious. But, but ultimately, this is the choice that is before you. It, it really points out those first two chapters, you have a sense of the whole book, really. This is the book. God has revealed himself to people. He has shown himself to be a God worthy of following them. He, him, he has warned them to not turn away from him, to not turn to false worship and disobedience. And then they do. And he brings discipline into their life to help them come back to him. And initially they respond, but then they fail again. That's, that's the choice presented. And it pushes forward this idea that sin leads people away from God. Laziness in fighting the enemies of God's people will ultimately result in compromise. Danger is present when you turn away from the Lord. Now, obviously, we're not called to fight physical enemies like this. In the New Testament, the enemies are spiritualized. Sin, Satan, the evil temptations of the culture, Right? These are our enemies, but the principle is the same. There are two ways to live. You can either agree that there's a depth of danger in sinfulness and turn to the Lord in trust and fight with faith as Judah does, or you can turn away as the other tribes did and trust in your own strength and refuse to push out the enemies of God that are present in your soul and tempting you, and you will find suddenly God opposing you in discipline. At the same time, the God of the book of Judges brings the offer of salvation, even to those who persist in sin, which is why the second section I've titled The Source of Salvation. What happens to people when they disobey God, either those who never knew him in the first place or those who have gotten some revelation of God, but they've chosen to walk away? What does the Bible say about that? Is it one and done, one, one chance, and then it's over? Is, is that the point? Well, that's not what Judges says. Well, what about people who grow up with a, a revelation of God like these people did, who, who've heard good news, but then they, they choose to rebel and turn away and be stubborn in their sinfulness? Is, is there any hope for people like that? Well, actually, the book of Judges gives incredible hope because again and again and again, God answers their groaning by providing for them a deliverer. And throughout this these biggest section of the book, you have all these deliverers that come to this incredibly stubbornly sinful and selfish people and answers their need with discipline to wake them up and then with salvation to deliver them. 
the source of salvation. That's what I would call this chapter. Because all these chapters, chapter 3 to chapter 16, the point of these chapters is that God provides salvation to his people exclusively for his own glory. He's the source of salvation. That's the point of the history of the judges. So I know it's tempting when we read the Old Testament uh, because I think we're just trained. We think this way. I don't know if it's because we're Americans and we like John Wayne and big strong people or something. I, I'm not sure. But for some reason, we look at these stories and we tend to go first to the topic of how can I be like Gideon or how can I be like Samson? And so we, we look at these and we think, well, is God telling me to grow my hair long and work out a lot? And maybe I should ask God questions by putting blankets outside and if it's wet and that's what Gideon did and that's how I'll that's not the point of these chapters it's not be like them or don't be like them these aren't character studies that is not the point of this this book the point is found in the intro sections where God raises up a deliverer that's the point it's not be like them more often than not in the Old Testament heroes and the character of focus is not someone we're supposed to be like so much as someone we're supposed to recognize that we need. Usually in the Old Testament, we're the people and the hero is someone that is pointing forward to someone greater. It's a wise way to read the Old Testament. Assume that the story is about God, not about how you should live. It's first about God teaching you how he is and how he acts. And then, yes, there's some character lessons, definitely, but it's first about God, and that's true of the judges. Let me say a couple words about these, these sections of the judges. First, a word about their sin. Uh, the sin of God's people, as referenced in chapter 2, is turning away from God and towards God's enemies. That, that's the sin. It's idol worship. And sometimes we think of idol worship as this provincial, kind of foolish, you think, man, why would they do that? I mean, you, you have, my children have these little children's Bibles, and they show them bowing down to these little golden figures. I mean, even my children sort of chuckle at the foolishness. Why would you do that? I mean, why would you think your toy is a god? It's so silly. Why would you do that? Well, they weren't quite so naive. I mean, it wasn't so superstitious. Here's what they thought. They thought there were real live gods, other gods, really spiritual. I mean, the image wasn't the god. They didn't think that. It represented the god. Okay, they're actually, they thought there actually was a real spiritual God out there. And they thought these spiritual gods could provide certain things. Like Baal, he provided good harvest. That's what he did. And in an agricultural community, that's like the money God. Okay, so if you think today, if there was a God called money God in the sky, money God in the sky, and he has a house, that if you go to this house and you do certain things, that will motivate that God to shell out money. That's basically how they thought about Baal. And according to the traditions of the land, the way Baal got going in giving out crops was if they performed certain immoral rituals in the temple. That's what got him motivated, okay? This was a effectively ensnaring religion because you could pursue a certain type of pleasure to receive a certain type of prosperity. That's the religion, okay? Very motivating, very ensnaring. No wonder they were drawn away from the religion of Yahweh to the religion of Baal. So th these weren't superstitious nomads bowing down to a piece of wood who don't understand that wood is just a certain kind of carbon composition. No, no. They believed in real gods who could give them real wealth. They wanted that wealth. They wanted to be provided for. They didn't trust Yahweh to do it. And by the way, this religion has a lot of extra immoral perks that I can do religiously and I can follow them and then I'll get a lot for what I want. So like any of us would have, they were tempted to follow their baser cravings and desires in order to achieve prosperity. It seemed more simple. Do this thing that I enjoy anyway and then God will give me what I want. We should identify with these people. They're not dumber than we are. They didn't know Einstein, but they understood some people have money and some people don't, just like we do. Their sin is just like our sin. So when we read about them turning to other gods, we should see our own temptations. 
We should be warned. Quick word about their discipline. God brings discipline into their life, and in this case, in the book of Judges, he gives them into the hand of oppressing rulers. And he's working with this nation as a nation, which he doesn't do in the New Testament because it's every tribe and nation after Pentecost, right? However, it's helpful to see the principle of discipline that's present here. God believes that the worst possible thing for any human being is to face him as an enemy. And so sometimes he allows suffering in the lives of those who profess to love him so that they won't face something much worse, namely a holy and righteous God. That's the pattern in Judges. They turn away from him. They start following Baal. They worship Baal. They want to be Baal worshipers. God brings discipline into their life in the form of foreign nations that come in. And in their groaning, they call out to the Lord in their misery. And then God responds mercifully by raising up judges. That's the pattern. Now, a word about these judges. We call this book the book of judges. And, and it's not that it's a, a bad word because that is something true in, in translating the word. But I think in America, um, it kind of sends us in the wrong direction in how we think of Because we tend to think of black robed people, maybe powdered wigs behind a, you know, behind a desk, meeting out, you know, 15 years and, you know, four months probation. And here, that's what we think about a judge. They may have done some of that, but that is not the accent of their role in the book of Judges, okay? The accent on these guys probably we would be better served to call them deliverers, saviors, saving leaders. It, it might be better in English. We would get more the point of the book if we call them the book of God's saviors. Th that might get us closer to what they actually do, what, what actually happens. We, we get thrown off, I think, by the word judges, and we, we think judicially. They may have done some of that, but that's not the accent in the book. This is the book of God raising up saviors for rebellious people. That's what this book is about. Now, when you read it that way, the connections to us today are a lot more clear. Let me just walk you through kind of the basic pattern of the judges. And I don't expect us to look into every detail, but just, just a few of these, the patterns. In chapter 3, the people do what is evil in the Lord's sight. God raises up Othniel, Caleb's younger brother, who defeats the king of Mesopotamia. The land has rest for 40 years. Then the people do evil again in the sight of the Lord. God raises up Ehud to deliver them from Eglon, the king of Moab. The land has rest for 80 years. Chapter 4, the people do evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord gives them into the power of a king of Canaan. A wise woman named Deborah prophesies to a Tibid man named Barak that God will use him to save Israel. And in the end, Sisera, the powerful enemy general with 900 chariots, is killed by Jael, a woman with a tent peg. Chapter 5, Deborah and Barak sing in declaration that Yahweh is indeed a divine warrior who has won victory for his people. The land has rest for 40 years. Chapter 6 through 8, the people again do evil in the sight of the Lord. They are oppressed by Midian. God uses a fearful and weak man, Gideon, with a limited army to bring about an incredible victory over Midian. The land has rest for 40 years. Chapter 9, civil war occurs between Gideon's sons, and God's people are fighting each other. Chapters 10, 11, and 12, God continues to raise up judges. People continue to do evil. They are oppressed, but they cry out to God. And Jephthah, a judge, is used to bring about a victory, but foolishly offers his daughter in human sacrifice after the battle. Helpful judge, but far from perfect. Civil war occurs between two tribes in Israel. Chapters 13 through 16, the people again do evil before the Lord. They are given into the power of the Philistines, and God calls Samson to save Israel. God fulfills Samson's calling in spite of Samson's continual unfaithfulness. There you have it. That's the cycle of the judges. Many commentators would describe it as this downward spiral. People sin, they cry out to God in their misery, God raises up a deliverer. Then people sin, cry out to God in their misery, God raises up a deliverer. Every time the judge dies, it gets worse again. The judges are pictures of a need that they can only partially fulfill. Let me say that again. The judges are pictures of a need that they can only partially fulfill. Apparently, in the book of Judges, 
they picture what is needed, don't they? I mean, they do amazing things. Gideon routes this army with a bunch of trumpets and torches. I mean, Deborah and Barak. Barak doesn't want to do anything. He's scared. And then they go, and, and, and God routes this army, and the general goes marching in panic, fleeing to this tent. He assumes he's safe. And this woman <laughs> takes him out with a tent peg to the temple. And so this mighty general is crushed, literally crushed, uh, by this woman. Culturally, the point is, uh, there is no boasting in any human, in any of this. This is exclusively Yahweh powerfully raising up deliverers for his people. A tent peg is more powerful in the book of Judges than a general with 900 chariots. The point is, when that tent peg is wielded by Yahweh, no one can stop it. Here's the point. Eliminate human boasting. There is one source of salvation. God will raise up humans in their weakness. A human context of weakness will reveal that Yahweh is the one who is saving. Salvation for God's people will always come in the context of human weakness. It's a pattern we begin to see over and over again in the judges. In the context of human limitations and human inabilities and human unsuspecting deliverers will turn out to be God's means of providing salvation. And then you jump forward to 1 Corinthians where it says, <laughs> the Greeks seek wisdom, but we speak of Christ crucified. Foolishness to the Greeks, but for us, the power and wisdom of God. And when you read the book of Judges, you see that pattern loud and clear. Because we're just like those people, and God saved us in the same way. Actually, where that is seen, I think, most clearly and surprisingly is in the man Samson. The man Samson is the last of the judges that we read about. And see if you see a pattern in his ministry that is ultimately fulfilled later on. See if you see something as I read these sections. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites whose name was Manoah and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children and you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean for behold you shall conceive and bear a son no razor shall come upon his head for the child shall be called a Nazarite to God from the womb and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahanadan between Zorah and Eshtahol and the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. The 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Etam and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. And they said to him, we have come to bind you that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. They said to him, no, we will not. We will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed with all his strength and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Who does that sound like? 
An angel approaches a woman who has no previous children, tells her that she will bear a son who will be called a Nazarite. This son will be special, set apart from the Lord for his birth. He will save Israel. The angel also appears to her husband to emphasize the trustworthiness of his message over his lifetime. This man is betrayed by his own brothers, bound and handed over to his enemies. And in the end, he is stripped of his strength, shorn of his glory, sold into captivity by one close to him, forsaken by the Lord, mocked and ridiculed, but achieves his ultimate victory through his death. Who does that sound like? God knew what he was going to do ultimately to save people through Jesus. Jesus wasn't the ultimate makeup plan for God when all the other plans failed. He knew what he was going to do. He's the father of time. He knows beginning to end. And so knowing that Jesus would save his people through that cross, he builds into the history of his people patterns and expectations and ways of salvation that for anyone reading their New Testament with, with gospel eyes and and with the illumination, the Spirit would say, we've seen all this before, imperfectly, imperfectly, certainly, because none of those guys in their character or in their eternity could ever finally save the people. They could only, like Samson, begin. They could only begin to do it. But in the end, there would be one who would never die and who would not be imperfect like Samson. Samson, like so many other of the, of the deliverers, he, he reveals what was needed both through his pattern of ministry and through his imperfections. The pattern of ministry he reveals positively. This is the kind of person we need. His character reveals negatively. We need someone way better than this. And that happens again and again in the Old Testament. It's like negative space painting. You paint positively. Here, here's, here's what it's going to look like, and here's what it's not going to look like. And that's exactly what Salmon does, Samson does, and Gideon does, and Jephthah does. There's going to be someone. He's also going to be born of a virgin. He's also going to save his people from their enemies. He's also going to be handed over by his brothers. He's also going to be bound. He's also going to achieve ultimate victory by dying. And no, it's not going to be through human strength and effort. No, it's going to be through human weakness so that God will be able to say, Israel cannot boast over me. No one may boast. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the only one who has achieved the victory. So no, Gideon, you're not going to be able to boast in your army because your boast is in the Lord. No, Samson, you're not going to be able to boast in your strength, in your weakness. You're going to accomplish more than you did in all of your strength, just like Jesus accomplished more by dying in weakness than every human, any human could possibly have imagined. Judges points us to the need of salvation. And if we're reading it with New Testament eyes, it reveals how that salvation will come about. And it reveals it as not having come about yet. That's why I think this book is ordered the way it is. There's two ways to live. Most of Israel follows the wrong way. God raises up judges and delivers. They're imperfect, but they picture what's needed in their ministry and in their pattern and in their deliverance, but they keep dying. So over and over again, you have the same pattern. For 40 years, the land has rest, and then the judge died, and then they're oppressed again. And then they have 80 years, there's rest, and then the judge dies. And you get this sense of, oh, these judges could only live forever. If only there could be a deliverer who could live forever. Wouldn't that be what they needed? If, if only they could have had a deliverer that lived forever. And if only there could have been a deliverer who was not so imperfect. He, he had all the good traits and none of the bad. If, if only there could have been a deliverer who wasn't so selfish at the end of his life like Gideon seems to be or, or wasn't such a, an absolute... <laughs> A uh, bad man like Samson seemed to be. If, if there only there could be someone who, who wasn't these ways but did provide the salvation and then also helpfully didn't die. And, and so the land could have a permanent rest. God's people could have permanent protection. Oh, if only judges begs 
for a king savior who can do what these judges d- did, but perfectly and permanently. It begs for that. You end judges saying, oh, if only there could be someone like that. If only there could be someone who could do that perfectly. If only there could be, but there isn't. And so the end of this book talks about the disgusting chaos of sin without a permanent deliverer. It punches that point home. Nobody. There's no one that can last long enough and be good enough. And let me make that abundantly clear. And he zooms in. Here's what life would be like with no deliverer. There's two stories at the end of Judges. I won't go into them at any depth. One is about Micah, a man in Israel, and his Levite priest. Basically, Micah has these false gods. He asks this Levite, who was supposed to be a priest for God, to serve him. He comes into this syncretistic religion household. Then a whole tribe of Israel comes. He gets this priest and says, wouldn't it be better if you serve us than just one man? And the Levite says, yeah, that sounds good to me. And he follows the tribe. And then they set up a whole new religion in the tribe of Dan, where they're following false gods. And it says this in chapter 18 of Judges. And the people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves. And Jonathan, the son of Gersh, son of Moses and his sons were priests to the tribe of Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. If you read that story, you'll notice that the Levite is left unnamed till the end of the story. Uh, Even if you weren't a Christian, you would have to appreciate the literary brilliance of that. It's left unnamed. Who is this Levite? Just random Levite wandering the land? He's worshiping. What a terrible Levite. This guy's terrible. He doesn't follow Yahweh. He's supposed to defend God. He's not defending God. Who is this guy? Who is this terrible Levite that's totally rejecting God? Oh, he's Moses' grandson. There's this sense of the shoe drops. Two generations. Moses' own grandson. The second story is revolting to read, the end of Judges. A man is traveling with his female companion when they were near Jebus. The day was nearly over, and the servant said to his master, Come now, let us turn aside to this city of the Jebusites, pagan city, and spend the night in it. And his master said to him, We will not turn aside into the city of foreigners, who do not belong to the people of Israel. Oh, there's irony. This final, (laughs) as the disgusting chaos of sin is described, it's the irony of this final story in Judges. We will not turn aside to the city of foreigners. You remember what happened to Lot, don't you? Don't you remember the story of Lot? He sang to his servant. (laughs) Don't you know that? Lot, someone turned aside to him. The whole city surrounded and sought to abuse those angels in in the book of Genesis. We would not do that. Let's go where God's people are. Let's go where the good people are. This is foolish to turn aside here. No, 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 unwise. Let's turn aside here. This could be another Sodom and Gomorrah, Jebus. Let's not, let's keep going. So they keep going to the Israelite town of Gebeah. And when they were near, they got to Gebeah. It says that the men of the city, as they were making their hearts merry, the men of the city, worthless fellows, surrounded the house, beating on the door. And they said to the old man who had brought them in, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, no, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man has come into my house, do not do this vile thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and made her go out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night. Concubine ends up dying. She is chopped to pieces, sent to every tribe in Israel. They gather in self-righteous outrage in light of how they have been acting. They almost obliterate the entire tribe of Dan, who on the one hand deserved it, but on the other hand is one of the tribes of God's people. And you get to the end of the book, and the final section of the book reads, In those days... There was no king 
in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone seemed to think, if I do it, it must not be illegal. The book ends with this despairing, overwhelmingly sad, gaping need. Chaos. Disgusting, revolting, depressing chaos. Because none of the judges could live long enough or be perfect enough to bring rest into the land. And so rightfully so, chaos erupts. God's people have become a new Sodom and Gomorrah. I feel sorry for any true believers, and I know there were some who lived in this era. All they had was a big gap. They had a profile, but no one to fill it. They had an outline, but no name to put in it. All they could do was believe and hope someday God fill that outline with a person who can bring deliverance. Someday, bring a person who is not imperfect like Samson and Gideon, but who can be the holy king, who can bring salvation, who can bring out of chaos deliverance. Bring someone who doesn't just bring rest for a generation, but for generation after generation after generation. Please, God, bring someone, my father and my grandfather, my grandfather, all they've known is this terrible downward spiral of sin. Even those who profess your name turn away from you. Bring someone, please God, bring someone who can stop the madness and deliver your people into rest. Who could that be? And then you get to the New Testament. And if I could, I would go back in time and say, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He fills it in perfectly. None of the negative traits that you've seen in these judges and all of the permanence that you desperately wanted. He's coming. Yes, I know no one was found that could take up bringing rest for God's people, but he's coming. He's coming. He will come. He will defeat the enemies of Satan and sin and death and hell. He will vanquish them, not by driving a stake through their head, but by letting stakes be driven through his hands and through his feet. He will bow down in death and he will destroy those enemies in his death. The weakness of the cross will vanquish the foes of God and will bring his people into a permanent rest so that he can say to every believer, come to me and lay down your burdens and I will give you rest. And if anyone calls on the name of the Lord, they will be saved and you will not have to live in the chaos of sin and doing what is right in your own eyes and choosing to distrust Yahweh because Yahweh will become a man and will come to earth and will die die on a cross and will save you and bring you into an eternal inheritance. And guess what? He'll never die. So the rest he brings to the land and to the people will last forever. If you're a Christian, marvel that you get to live today. Why should you read about Jesus in the New Testament and meditate on it in your private devotions and set aside time to think about him? <laughs> Let's let a true believer from the book of Judges motivate us. Can you imagine what they would say to us? Why, why would you not read about him? You know what we had to go through? And you know who he is. And you can read about all of his perfections and, and how glorious he is and the promises. Get in there and read about him. You know what it's like to hope in Samson? What's, read about Jesus. 
You know what they would say to those of us who are struggling, like me and like, I'm sure, many of you, to pray and to call out to Jesus? They would say, oh, trust me. It was so much harder to trust God when Gideon was the best we had. I mean, you can trust God in prayer, and Jesus is the best you have. How would we be motivated by a true believer in this time to say, look, don't turn away to false gods of money. I mean, trust me, that just leads to chaos and sin. It's bad doing right what's in your own eyes. It's terrible. Trusting yourself and your own opinions and your own sense of right and wrong, that leads to devastating chaos and disgusting sin. Trust me, we saw it over and over and over again. But if you trust yourself to Jesus, the true deliverer, oh, it leads to rest and joy. You, you may have difficulties, but not the kind of disgusting, revolting pain and eternal condemnation that comes to those who turn away from him. That's the book of Judges. Isn't it worth reading? Isn't it worth getting in there when you're looking at a culture that has these slippery definitions of right and wrong. And isn't it worth reading when you don't feel restful? It paints a picture that the New Testament supplies the portrait of. Everything they didn't have, we have. Everything they wanted, we've been given. Everything they desperately needed and the danger they faced, we have been delivered from. The book of Judges shouts to a New Testament believer, rejoice that the depth of sin has been resolved in the death and resurrection of Christ and live your life entrusting yourself to that ultimate, permanent, true Savior. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming. We thank you for delivering us, for crushing, Lord, crushing the enemies that for us feel so strong, so countless. Lord, the enemies of sin and death and Satan. And Lord, you crushed them, Lord. Lord, you took our place on that cross. You received the wrath we deserved. And by doing that, you are our warrior who delivers us into eternal rest. And we rejoice in you. And Lord, I, I pray that you would give us great joy in you this week. That we would be like Deborah and Barak who lift up a shout to our divine warrior, the conquering King Jesus, who saves us by his blood and by his resurrection. But I pray you would give us joy this week to, to declare to every fear and to every doubting moment, to every tempting moment, no, we have, a, we have a deliverer who's given us rest. We rejoice in him. Help us to do that, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If in any way you feel like you've been tempted by thinking that you can kind of follow your own way, maybe little ways, maybe big ways, but following your own way has seemed really good, it seemed really safe, it seems like a really great idea, um, but you want to submit a portion of your life or maybe the entirety of your life to the Lord, uh, it may just be an area where you've been kind of stubbornly following your own way, and you just want to acknowledge that and motivated by this book, you want to entrust that area or your whole life to the Lord, please come forward. Let, let me pray for you and pray with you. Um, I, I think the Lord would honor that if you would come forward, let me pray for you. So as we close, just want to invite you to do that. Uh, humbling ourselves after God's word is one of the ways we honor God's word and it's one of the ways we change. So let me just encourage you to do that. For the rest of us, you can be dismissed. Have a grace-filled week and we'll see you next Sunday.